ladies and gentlemen, we are going to have a very uh, interesting subject to be, to be discussed uh, this afternoon. State of multiculturalism, cultural diplomacy, and the EU crisis. And we have uh, Mr. Busek, Busek, who is the very prominent person in all of Europe. I don't think that we need any introduction for him. Uh, and yesterday there was a reaction to read long biography, so in line with this uh, reaction, I will only mention Mr. Busek's name, and perhaps he may wish, when he gives the uh, 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 word or microphone to the others, uh, they may introduce themselves in one or two sentences. And regarding the remainder of the panelists, they are not there for the moment, but we may start with the present ones. Then it may, the others may join us. Now, I would like to ask you to join me to extend a very warm welcome to Mr. Busek and the panelists. Your Excellency, Mr. Jakes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear panelists, it's quite a pleasure to be with you. Uh, that's enough of introduction. Uh, I think we have uh, a very rich theme. Uh, to talk about multiculturalism, I think, uh, is uh, some days uh, to do. Uh, to speak about uh, the EU crisis, we can speak about weeks. Uh, it's even the, the question which kind of crisis we are touching and so on and so on. So far, I think it's very rich. As already mentioned, the intention is for sure that the panelists are making uh, their commentaries uh, and, so, and their views, but I think we want also to open uh, to uh, the audience uh, for discussion because it's more vivid, colorful, and so on. Uh, the others we have also, we have been at the lunch, and I think uh, we are crossing the street, uh, and they will arrive in time. So far, ah, first result, uh, well, <laughs> Welcome to you, milady. Uh, so far, uh, I think I'm asking the panelists to stick uh, between three and five minutes. If this is possible, I would be extremely happy. I'm not following the row which is here. Let's do it after the row. If we can start uh, with uh, yeah, the right outside or left outside, whatever you want. Please. Okay, my name is Siak Kunis. I come from the Netherlands, University of Maastricht. Um, I, I just want to make a few comments about state multiculturalism. The, where I come from, uh, there is no such thing as state multiculturalism. There is a lot of skepticism about this idea of multiculturalism, at least uh, in most layers of, uh, let's say, political leaders or political parties. Um, they feel that, uh, and I think they're to a certain extent also right, uh, they feel that it is a too. They feel it is too much uh, to expect that all cultural differences will be resolved by just living together. It's a sort of, uh, in our, my country, quite a negative, uh, pessimistic uh, sphere as far as multiculturalism is, is concerned. And everybody knows that we have uh, quite strong populist parties. Um, which also sort of take advantage of uh, this negative uh, atmosphere. I'll talk to you uh, more about that uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, uh, the EU crisis, I don't have much to say about it, except for maybe one simple hope that this crisis might, might uh, have some benefits as, as well, because it's the first time that I think in the EU uh, countries have really had to think about how much do we really care for other countries and, and, and to what extent are we really willing, uh, for instance, to set some kind of redistribution in place. Uh, and maybe if this crisis turns out right, then uh, we also learn that, let's say, the Dutch, the German, and the Greeks, they share a lot more than maybe tourism and the fact that they happen to be on the continent of Europe. Uh, the cultural diplomacy, well, just one observation uh, from being with you the couple of day, last days, yesterday and today. On the one hand, I, I encounter sheer pessimism, uh, atrocities, uh, like what we talked about yesterday. 
Um, also, what, what all these things that women have to endure on the one hand. On the other hand, I encounter also surprising optimism, for instance, when it comes to the arts, that we think that, well, that art, the arts will probably solve all the problems in the world. I would like to steer a bit more of a middle ground and, well, maybe uh, I would just like to get into that more tomorrow morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, concerning multiculturalism, we have been a little bit pessimistic, but your last remark on culture, and uh, that's for sure connected with multicultural, uh, is giving a sign of optimism. Maybe I think if we are doing multiculture with culture and uh, without politics, it would be more successful. But this is my private opinion. Please be so kind and continue. Oh, thank you. I'm John Hobson. I'm from uh, the University of Sheffield in the UK. Um, I was drafted onto this panel yesterday rather randomly. No complaints from me, I, no problem at all. Uh, I'm just wondering how to speak to this particular topic. I'm probably not going to do a terribly good job. Um, I wonder if I could just take a couple of minutes, therefore, to air a few of my thoughts about, more generally, about intercultural diplomacy. We've heard a lot about that, and obviously it impacts upon this particular kind of discussion. And as I'll say tomorrow, I, I, I don't want to appear like the spectre at the feast. You know, we have been celebrating people who have done some really fantastic things uh, in the real world. Remember, I'm an academic. I hide away in an ivory tower. I write my books, it's all very important. And I make judgments about the world, which is wonderful. It's a privilege, but I'm not actually doing a great deal. People here have done a great deal, and I, I admire that and I respect that. But, a bit like one of those newspaper editorials, isn't it? But, I, when, when, you, when you look on the website, you know, there's, which I have to say is an extremely impressive website, you know, there's lots of little sort of boxes, people talking, we have stuff on soft power. Uh, we have a lot of stuff on human rights and humanitarianism and, and sort of liberal discourse. And I'm sure that I'm going to say nothing that you haven't already heard or thought about or thought about deeply, but uh, I would just like to get some of this off my chest. So, for example, when we talk about soft power, um, I mean, soft power is infinitely more preferable to hard power, but soft power is still power. It's still trying to achieve something for somebody's particular aim. If you read Joseph Nye's book on this, it's a very well written book, it's well thought out. Ultimately it's about pushing American power around the world. Um, it's if if you look at the discourse on human rights and humanitarianism, you know, this is this is discussed by people with undeniably the deepest of, of human goods and human intentions. I, I don't want to in any way denigrate that. But it's still a Western discourse. Now yeah, sure. Because it's West and it doesn't make it wrong. The West hasn't done all the wrong in the world. The West hasn't done too badly, at least until recently with the financial crisis. But if we're talking about intercultural diplomacy, we need inter, not mono. And if it's just diplomacy from the West to the rest, and if it's a kind of paternalist discourse, as I believe the human rights and some of the humanitarian interventions you're talking about, then we end up with a monoculturalism not intercultural diplomacy, it's monocultural diplomacy. And arguably it's not diplomacy because it's monocultural <coughs> imposition from one side upon the other. So, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I know this is a miserable thing to say, and it's hardly in the spirit of the celebration to which we've become accustomed in the last few days, and I don't want to spoil that, but I just want to say that and talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. I hope in some way that impacts upon this present panel, but uh, I'll let you be the judge of that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Please, please kind of continue. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, my name is Mark Aspinwall, and uh, I work at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, I'm originally from Boston in the US, but I've uh, been in, in the UK for about, for a little over 20 years now, so very much from, uh, from that side of the in pond. In the UK or Scotland? Uh, in Scotland. Well, still the UK, still, and probably still, <laughs> and, and, and probably will be the UK after 2014, although uh, it will certainly change the debate. And we, and in fact, it's an interesting, uh, uh, issue to discuss what the uh, what this means for for the UK and for um, uh, Catalonia and other regions as well. Uh, these these kinds of debates that are going on. I, I, I think that will be. I wasn't planning to speak on this at, at all, um, but I think we'll continue to be part of the UK. But it will change the way that we talk about our regions in the UK and the way that uh, Scotland governs itself, probably, and also England to a certain extent. 
Anyway, I have colleagues who are much more uh, impressive on this, um, in fact, who are impressive on this, and, and like me, uh, who know about it. I, 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 I was also like John, I would echo a lot of what John said, except that uh, for being academics doesn't necessarily mean that we're tucked <laughs> away in an ivory tower. Every time I do a project of some kind, I interview dozens and dozens of people like the, like the politicians, the diplomats, the, um, the bureaucrats, the civil servants, uh, the NGOs. I know exactly what they think, and many times I sympathize with them. Uh, when I'm done with a project, I'm uh, pretty well aware of the different sides of an argument, and so I could speak about it. Um, I, I, another sense is I would echo what John says, and I, I think of Robert Cox, a Canadian uh, political economist. All theory is for someone and for some purpose. When you talk about soft power, this is, but make no mistake, this is the US promoting its values, freedom, democracy, liberal human rights, all good things, but American generated and American dominated. Now, um, just having you know, said that briefly, I would, I, I would switch to the EU crisis, by which I interpreted it to mean the Euro crisis, the Eurozone crisis. We don't feel it quite so much in the UK, um, patting ourselves on our back sanctimoniously for not having joined and not, therefore not having to spend very much, um, except in the Irish case. Uh, but uh, I, I just struggled, having been asked yesterday to, to address you, struggled to see the, the connection between cultural diplomacy and the Eurozone crisis and worked really hard at it. Because I think, I mean, from the perspective of somebody in a university, the, the most concrete things that we do on behalf of cultural diplomacy are to send our students around Europe through the Erasmus program. Uh, we do a lot of that, and around, around the rest of the world through other exchange programs as well. We do a lot of that kind of thing, but I'm not sure that they come back necessarily with a more favorable view or uh, uh, of other parts of the world that they've, uh, that they've been to. I'm, I'm just not sure that they do that. They learn about it perhaps the Germans could go on a, an Erasmus exchange to Athens and learn about the Acropolis, but that's not going to make the Germans any happier about bailing out the Greeks, uh, I, I don't think. I think a lot of this boils down, quite frankly, to material self-interest and egotistical uh, uh, self-interest, um, economic self-interest, and it's hard to see, uh, at least in something this grave and this deep, um, how cultural diplomacy or how knowledge about the arts and knowledge about each other's cultures is going to help them. That would be my pessimistic view. I'd be, I'd be happy to be uh, corrected on that, but that, that's my pessimistic view of, of the Eurozone crisis. Uh, allow me to add something. Uh, <coughs> first of all, uh, that's the official opinion uh, in, in the United Kingdom. We have nothing to do with the Euro crisis. Uh, but I think you have a very nice point of view uh, by Mr. Cameron. Mr. Cameron is saying, oh, let's be happy about the pound. And then he's saying, but I want to be involved in the decision making about the euro <laughs> because it's extremely important for the city of London. And I think the city of London is uh, not so much influential on politics or <laughs> that's an open question. But beg your pardon, it, it's a nasty remark from my side. Milady, it's up to you. Yes, uh, the euro crisis is not the crisis of the euro. It's the crisis of trust in the European Union and it's a crisis of truth, trusting each other and making true what the agreements were. If we go back to Lisbon where the European Union had a, a great project to uh, invest in research and to be the most competitive market when you have a look at it later on, nobody did the investment they promised to do. So um, there is a lot <coughs> to say about this, truth and democracy. And I think uh, that is as, as much important. And coming to the uh, multicultural, I do not like this name. I should call it cultural pluralism. And if we define what culture is. So let's go to the definition. And the definition of United Nations says, it is what the group believes, and its traditions, and it is artifacts, and it's a lot of basic things. And to me it seems as if we were talking about culture as if it was only fine arts. Culture is much more than fine arts. The European Union was not built on a cultural basis. There are no articles.
projects, and they came only later on in Maastricht and uh, in Lisbon about dealing somehow with culture, but that was not to say that there is a common culture, there is a diversity of cultures. So let's go back and give the people their dignity back with their own culture and let them have the pride to have their own traditions and not make a big pot and to say it's all the same, it's multi. I think that would be a very good tool uh, to promote cultural diplomacy because this would oblige each citizen to learn about the other and to learn what are the other's traditions and what are his beliefs. And by knowing, the world can only get better. Thank you very much. Please, what is the view from uh, Iceland? Yes, uh, well, we are talking about a mixture of topics, a little cocktail here, uh, about the Euro crisis economic crisis in Europe, and we are talking about uh, cultural diplomacy, which, as I understand stand it, has to do with the way we handle crisis, how we talk together, uh, and how we, we, we arrive at solutions. Now, Iceland had uh, a terrible experience, in, uh, has had a, an exper a terrible, difficult years, uh, after the fall of the Icelandic Bank uh, in the autumn of 2008. Then uh, Icelandic banks had been expanding very irresponsibly and misbehaving uh, throughout the world and in Europe, in, in Holland and in uh, Great Britain. So it came to a point where the British government uh, took down the largest Icelandic bank in operating in Great Britain by use of anti-terror law. They put uh, this uh, NATO ally on list with Al-Qaeda and North Korea, and this was real. This is what happened. And the result was that the whole Icelandic financial sector collapsed. And uh, in consequence of this, the <coughs> economy of Iceland was in dire trouble. Uh, our de deficit in uh, 2009 was, uh, forget the numbers, but you just to see the proportions, was uh, 250 billion in minus. Now it is uh, 20 billion in minus, from 250 billion down to 20 billion. How did we do this? We did this uh, with a combination of hiring taxes and cutting down uh, expenditure of state and municipalities. Uh, in my ministry, we have cut down in real terms during the last, in the course of the last four years, between 20 and 25 percent. We've done this with the police, with the courts, hospitals, schools, universities, everything. And how do you do this? Well, in a way, by the means of cultural diplomacy. We have a saying in Iceland that when you get into trouble in heavy seas, you take to the oars. Everybody takes to the oars together. That is the only way of getting out of the difficulty, to take to the oars together. But there is a precondition for taking to the oars together. You must be on the same boat. You must be on the same boat. So the task of the government has been to put everybody on the same boat, because we were not on the same boat before the crisis at all. And this must be for real, and this must also be the minds of people. And we will, the government will be judged uh, by the way people, the population, thinks this. 
why is it that people were willing to accept these cuts? Because people feel that we are trying to introduce socially just uh, policies. Now, I will tell you a little story. I will, won't take long time to do it. Iceland is a very small society. Now, if you come to Iceland, it's uh, just like coming to any German or British uh, town or village, very peaceful. But uh, in the fall of 2002 and at the beginning of 2009, there were demonstrations every night, thousands and tens of thousands in this little society in front of our parliament. There were fires there, and we were afraid at the time that the parliamentary buildings would be invaded. And I remember that uh, one night I was in the parliament building, I was in the opposition at that time, and I was having an interview. I was on, on a direct uh, broadcast on, on television. And we could hear the X first X being thrown at the building and then stones and glass started to break. And the night before, the police had been using tear gas uh, against the crowds. And they were standing there this night. And I can remember the television interviewer who was interviewing me, he was holding his microphone like that. It was very dramatic. And after the interview, I went to the window overlooking the square and there was a policeman standing beside me and uh, we saw that the police was preparing to use tear gas again and then suddenly somebody or some group took themselves out of the crowd and created a human wall of defense in front of the police. And the police put their shields away and their tear gas. And the policeman put my, his arm around my shoulder and he said, thank God we are back home to Iceland. In other words, what he was saying, we are a community. We are in it together. And this is the only way to resolve difficult crises, to be in it together. But the precondition for that is social justice, being in re real terms on the same boat. Thank you very much uh, for the example, also for the story, and for outlining that solidarity is one of the backbones of uh, Europe. Uh, otherwise, we won't uh, survive, uh, I may say also concerning <coughs> uh, speaking about the one boat. Uh, I may tell you another example, which is also very typical. We are using the phrase, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Huh? I think sometimes we know the light, but where is the tunnel? Uh, that's also the problem. But now up to Romania, do you know the light at the end of the tunnel? <laughs> always, we always watch the light, but <laughs> yeah, we are deep inside of the tunnel, I, I'm, I'm afraid. So I, I took a look on, on the this announcement of the panel, and I don't know how to interpret. Uh, am I the last one, as it happens, coming in, into the EU group? This is great, because I, I would say that coming from East, I'm the first one. So uh, that's, that's a huge and dramatic uh, question in uh, nowadays Romania. Are we in the avant-garde or the aria guard? <laughs> Hard to say because my Romanian uh, observation would be the European crisis seems to be like uh, our panel right now. So there are seven men and one lady. Uh, half of the population is represented only by one lady. Thank you for coming here as an alibi for us. May I say, social is more powerful. <laughs> That's for sure. On the other hand, I don't see the, the younger members of this uh, panel with all respect for, for the experience and for your position, even mine. Always from their seats, I understand. <laughs> That's happened in my country. I think I you should put him into the organization. <laughs> <laughs> I would be glad to, to uh, participate or to uh, sit on my seat uh, to a panel organized only 
for women expressing their, their views on the European crisis. Why not? Can we have We have brilliant uh, women uh, into politics right here, present with us. So, but uh, otherwise, I, I would say uh, in Romania, uh, we have uh, a lot of <laughs> a lot of understandings of the multiculturalism. So we are a multicultural society, mainly in Transylvania, where uh, Hungarians, uh, uh, Romanians, and, uh, and uh, of course, Saxons, uh, Schwaben, uh, in, a, in a general terms, Germans, are present from 1,000 years, less now than previously, unfortunately. But uh, yes, this is another problem of the multiculturalism. How we accept the shared the power as the power it is in our country with the women. Uh, the women are uh, less represented there and uh, I think they, they have their own experience, they have uh, expertise, so why aren't we able to let aside our patriarchal way of uh, seeing, uh, uh, I know, the development of the country. But uh, on the other hand, uh, in our university we had the uh, uh, pretty silent but uh, inactive debate on multiculturalism. Some of the professors said, well, if we teach in uh, uh, Hungarian, uh, German, and Romanian, it's okay. We represent the interest of the communities in Transylvania. Some others said, we live now in a uh, globalized world. We should also accept that teaching in uh, English, in French, in Italian, why not, in Spanish, is also part of the multicultural representation and interest. I think everybody's right, like uh, uh, the wise Solomon. <laughs> but uh, but uh, uh, the debate is only at uh, its beginning. Uh, in any case, uh, Romanians uh, face uh, a lot of problems and uh, confusion right now, and uh, they are uh, also uh, involved in, uh, in their own way in the European crisis. If I uh, remember only the Roma problem, uh, very present in, uh, in Europe and outside of Europe. Also, we exported also this, not only Romania, but also Bulgaria, other states. I think uh, this is a huge, a huge problem to solve in the years uh, to come. And uh, on the other hand, uh, I would say uh, it's a very uh, strange uh, understanding of this uh, diversity in Europe, uh, very claimed indeed, and, uh, and uh, uh, very realistic, uh, on the other hand, scene, because uh, uh, what happens to my compatriots, not all of them are experiencing this, but some of them, this is for sure they're experiencing, is the fact that um, they come with high hopes in, uh, in uh, the western part of our continent, of, of the com community, European community, and then they are not accepted in some countries, they don't have uh, the right to work, I mean legally work, and uh, you can notice some uh, doctors in philosophy or uh, in history or in arts uh, serving in the, in the bars and uh, speaking four or five languages coming from Romania. And I think uh, this is not what they hoped coming here. Thank you very much. May I give you the floor? Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, you mentioned especially in your last statement a very important thing. Uh, Austria, my home country, was one of the countries blocking uh, the uh, mobility of the labor force for even seven years. I may say uh, what I recognize strange was, first of all, for seven years, everybody was saying they will come and they will take other jobs. So far, we have to beat them up. Now, since May, mobility is possible. Now, it's written in the, in the newspaper and commented, why are they not coming? <laughs> huh? It's a real pity. We missed an opportunity. How you can see how public mood can be really <laughs> sometimes crazy. <laughs> but uh, Ruth, you will teach us. Ruth Lippers, former Prime Minister of the Netherlands, High Commissioner on Refugees, and so on and so on. Uh, I've just a, a, a question about how the afternoon is working. Three to five minutes, then it is open for question and answer period out of the time. No, that's after my speech, beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> I have to speak at, at uh, 3 o'clock and you at 3.30. Okay, then I'll stay two or three. Okay, <laughs> okay, that's all right. Now, just, just, just two points. I'm, I, I guess I'm the 
oldest here. So I've learned through decades that we multiculturalism, as you said, diversity, diversity is becoming more and more important. So I think that is the, in the, in the title, a good point. I use the word diversity to, to work more later on. It's, it's part of my heritage of the Earth Charter. But when you say about the AD crisis, uh, for me that starts a long time ago. I tell you with a short anecdote, part of my personal history. In preparation for Maastricht, you remember this was in 1991. One or two? One. 1991. I thought, this is good. I'm an economist myself. After the single market, which I co-created, we need now a single currency. It's fine. But before having that meeting in Maastricht, we better go for more democracy in Europe. So I take a visit to President Mitterrand important country, and I shared with him my ideas that Europe would organize itself as a political union in a democratic way. So you can imagine what I said. And then Mitterrand said to me, Mais, Monsieur Hubert, le Parlement européen, c'est zéro. You understand that? La Commission est zéro aussi. <coughs> zéro plus zéro fait zéro. <laughs> so this was not easy. <laughs> And I understood the time has still not come to create a democratic euro. I went home. I called my friend Helmut Kohl. <coughs> I said, Helmut, I had a disappointment in Paris. We too are Christian Democrats. We spoke a lot about the need to go for a political union. And in order to achieve that, on the way to Maastricht, I just went to President Mitterrand and I told this story. And I think the conclusion is clear. I stop my activities. We will not have a single currency. Because we're doing that with any perspective of democracy in Europe. So I think it's wrong. And then Helmut Kohl blasted me and said, you cannot do that. It's so important that after the single market We now got a single currency. So please don't give up. Prepare yourself. It will not be easy, but we have to achieve in Maastricht. So I did. And there was a treaty of Maastricht. But if you might call that, it is an unfinished treaty. This is 1991. In 1994, I left politics, still with Jacques Delors as president of the commission, but he was walking out too. And I really hoped that in the years after, they would be given another try to make the unfinished <coughs> business <coughs> finish. Because I was convinced that in a single currency, you need some governance. And that governance requires a full European Central Bank There came a European Central Bank, but not with the normal authority of a Central Bank, with all sorts of limitations. <coughs> you need a sort of Minister of Finance, could be a member of the Commission, but it should be one person responsible from an economic perspective. Didn't come. Didn't come. So I was not surprised that when we had all this trouble with financial innovation, Icelandic crises and other crises, that at some point the speculation, the speculator would take possession of 
of the euro crisis, and then you are lost for years again. So now I think that Angela Merkel is making a, a courageous effort to clean up the unfinished business of Helmut Kohl. Helmut Kohl was, of course, a great politician. He realized German unification, and there's a lot to praise about him, but he gave in on the democracy, and then he had to leave himself, so it is known. So that took us quite some years. Before we are sitting now, with Van Rompuy and Bill Gates, to see how do we manage this one group of banks and other elements of this plan. So that can be done, but it is very difficult. And I've taken too many minutes already, uh, so I better stop you. Yeah, you'll hear me later, and then uh, we'll do it. Thank you very much, Ruud, also t telling these stories out of, out of experience, because I may say that's giving hope. Obviously, I think we are confronted with the fact uh, that we have to learn out of history. That always said we are not learning out of history. I may say the European Union is an example where we have learned out of history, looking to the fact that for three, three centuries there were wars between the French and the Germans and so on and so on. Uh, this has to be said. So far, the Peace Nobel Prize is, is totally right uh, here. But everybody is blaming this, uh, which is also a great nonsense, because uh, I think here we have some results. I learned ancient Greek, we learned a phrase which had only two words, paton maton. I think suffering we are learning. Uh, I think obviously we have not enough suffered. Uh, but now it's up to you, to the younger generation, to you all. Uh, you hear here some comments, let's use the time. Uh, as far as I can see, 60 minutes are left. Please come up. Last row, here. Aha, uh -huh, you need a micro, that's interesting. Hello, my name is Janine. Uh, you kind of already touched the topic I want to ask about. It's a Peace Nobel Prize for the EU, and since you're all very famous people, I would like to get your opinions, but don't, please don't refer to uh, econo economics, because what I want to know, what your opinion is, seriously, in terms of peace, not necessarily integration, but what the EU has done for peace in Europe, and outside of Europe. Okay, uh, it, it, if one question is directed to one of the panel, please say it. I think it was here, third row, fourth row, somebody was showing up. Here. Hi, my name is Lena. I'm a student at the ITB here, and I was wondering more, I feel that in the UK there is very strong anti-EU sentiment at the moment. And I was wondering, do you think uh, you can use cultural diplomacy to sort of combat this? And maybe even do you think the onus is on uh, the EU, so the other member states, to sort of you know, use cultural diplomacy to make the UK want, want to stay within the EU? Thank you. And it's okay. directed at everyone. Okay, thank you. Let's take a third and fourth question and then up to the panel. Nobody? All are satisfied? Oh, last row. It's working. Well, I see the red lights on, the battery's going down. I'll change it in a minute. Darnell Summers, I'm staff member at the ICB. When we discuss multiculturalism, one thing just occurred to me. I think it's important, maybe in these types of discussions, to have some of the multicultural uh, people part of the discussion. I think that would help to keep it from being sterile and somewhat disjointed. That's not to say that, don't take this personally, that's not to say that anyone here has made the discussion sterile, but uh, Mr. Yakish is Turkish, but he's, but he's not from Kreuzberg, you know? And uh, we have, I think it's important to engage these people. If we're gonna talk about multiculturalism, and I've been in Germany over 40 years. I came to Germany as a soldier in the uh, 1960s. And certainly that experience for the German people and for the people of Europe uh, had its own cultural aspects. But there again, I just wanted to ask or to just get your feeling on how necessary it is to, in, these types, in this type of environment, to have discourse with people who are faced with that question of multiculturalism. How important is it 
to engage these people and have them have face-to-face -face, uh, conversations, not necessarily with the whole population, but people who represent them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, who else? One question is still open. Please, the man with the head. In front. Where's the micro? I'm changing the battery. <laughs> Working. Hello, the, the man with the hat is always the professor from ICD with background in sociology. Um, I have a question regarding uh, cultural diplomacy and the U EU crisis and um, I would like to know whether you share my vision of the EU crisis as a um, uh, like disappointment in change of vision what the European Union was and should be and the promise which, is war, uh, which it was for civil societies which joined the European Union and which it became regarding that what you said in particular after 1990. And I believe, um, I believe personally that when we look at civil societies uprising in the European Union nowadays, <coughs> it is not a coincidence that uh, civil society responds um, contrary in the Western uh, members of uh, European Union and not in the East because Germany was part of, or became, West Germany became part of the European Union due to the fact that the Holocaust and the crimes of the Nazi time have made it necessary to take back the, like, the interest in austerity politics and economical power of Germany in Europe in order to better be integrated. This changed after the unification, in my opinion, and changed German policies in terms of like using the economical strength of Germany against the other weaker member countries, which at the end is about to danger the vision of the European Union in which I personally grew up in the West. And I would like to know what you think about it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Now the panel. I think first of all, what about the United Kingdom and Europe? Okay, yeah. Who of you wants? Okay, thanks very much. I, I, I uh, said that I'd take that second question on the, on the UK and the European Union because I've done, I, I did some research on it and uh, published on it uh, now some years ago. But I, I do think actually this, the UK socially is more positive toward, uh, toward Europe than it would oftentimes seem. This political elite and the media in particular, the media, are very, very uh, mixed at best and oftentimes very hostile to the European Union for a variety of reasons to do with to do with the political culture, to do with the, the Commonwealth, the relationship with the US, the view that, uh, that the UK is quite different and separate, which is wrong, actually. Um, on, on economic grounds, particularly, and on social grounds, it's just quite integrated and linked to the EU. And those who study it know that. Uh, and a lot of people whose livelihoods are linked to, uh, to companies, to economic activity across the European Union also know that. And if you look at studies on the, um, on the public opinion, uh, it's, quite, it's quite closely linked partly to education and age, but also to economic profession and status. I think some of it's generated by the media. I think some of it's generated by this old story about, about empire and about the US and so forth that, <coughs> that doesn't quite die. Um, but, but the UK, citizen, uh, UK citizens are increasingly through travel, through education, and various other things, and, and intermarriage, they're quite linked <laughs> to the EU. So I'd say, I, th I think that the, the, the hostility, the Euroscepticism is dying. Uh, it will take a long time. It's going to go away, and the UK is going to be quite linked. I have a I have a quick response on the first question, and I, I could carry on, but I won't. But uh, the the Nobel Peace Prize, I, I think you you're you're if you're insinuating that the EU did nothing to promote peace in in, in, in Europe, I think that's absolutely wrong. Over several decades, it's linked the economies and the societies and the states and the governments of particularly the six principal uh, initial members in France and Germany, in particular, through the Cold and Steel Treaty. Uh, irrevocably together, and it, it absolutely, some would say it's due to NATO, and NATO's played a role, and other institutions, the OSCD and others have played a role in linking. Europe is now the most heavily institutionalized place on the planet. Uh, it's the safest, most secure place on the planet, and it's because in part of the European Union. Now, the timing of the Nobel Peace Prize is atrocious, it was awful. The timing couldn't have been worse, uh, but I do think that the spirit behind it in terms of Especially at the last point, I may join you. Uh, I think uh, if you look into history, the downfall of big empires is always creating wars. And that the Soviet Empire broke down 
uh, I think there was no war in consequence because the newly independent states uh, had the perspective of the European Union. And I think this is a factor of stability of tremendous importance because otherwise it would have happened like uh, the downfall of Yugoslavia because here the perspective was not so clear. Uh, I think uh, I share your totally in this direction. Another question I would have uh, is the tunnel helping uh, to uh, Great Britain coming closer to Europe? <laughs> okay, but that's it. No. Uh, okay. Uh, other comments from the panel, please? The lady, ladies first. I think frustration comes by speaking over European affairs. As you have not one speech, you have 27 different speeches. You have uh, now uh, the meeting of the heads of states and governments with large press. Why isn't it a simple meeting of European affairs? It's something normal. It should not be any longer a summit. So if we start to talk about European affairs on a European way and on a common way, that would already uh, be a big progress. But I think there is uh, one uh, frustration coming out of, of uh, the question of our colleague on multiculture. I think we are on the way after all these treaties, after uh, the Charter of Fundamental Rights on the society of individuals. And we have no means to treat with the individual rights for his or her culture and uh, whatever being individually. So we are in a society rather loose for what is concerned as a group, and we do not quite yet to deal with it. Nation state is about uh, failing, the feeling of strong nation states, while well, we have our flags here, yeah, we are happy to be uh, Spanish or Portuguese, but we are Europeans. And uh, this way of dealing with culture, with a total average of population, there. We are not yet there and we have no real strong cultural poli policy to promote what we mean by culture. Thank you very much. Uh, I may quote uh, Jean-Claude Juncker. I, l I remember he, he always said to me, it's really crazy. After a European meeting, always somebody is running out and saying, big victory for my country had in this recent meeting. Nobody is running out and saying it was a big victory for Europe. Uh, that's real nonsense. He added, Luxembourg is too less important uh, to say we did the great victory. Uh, but this was a nice, <laughs> polite phrase. Please. Yes, uh, when it comes to the European Union, I may be a little spoil sport in this, uh, in this context and in this discussion. Because on the level of <coughs> cultural cooperation, political cooperation, cultural diplomacy, if you like, I am a European, very much a European. But when it comes to deciding how to run the energy sector in the western fjords of Iceland, where they live 10,000 people, I'm an anti-European, and I am a Euro-skeptic in that sense. And uh, I accept that the European Union, you see, may I start again and say that what may be right in one place may be wrong in another, what may be right in one time may be wrong in another. And uh, I accept that the European Union uh, has uh, done something spectacular for Europe in preserving peace. I accept this, but I am a skeptic when it comes to a monetary union because when you have fulfilled the Maastricht Treaty with a political union, a monetary union, a political union, with a central bank in Frankfurt, 
deciding over the whole entire union with punitive, with punitive powers against those who cannot stand up to the uh, questions or standards uh, raised, I ask if we are not uh, fueling, fueling disagreements and disputes and unrest. Uh, again, so if there is not a contradiction here, I would like to hear comments on this. And I'll give an example of, of, of how it has saved us in Iceland standing outside the monetary union. Now, we are a tiny society with a tiny currency, Krona. Uh, the negative side to this is that we became easy prey to speculators on the money market. Easy prey to them. But at the same time, the <coughs> positive thing was that in the crisis, or during the crisis, and in the aftermath of the crisis, we reaped the benefit of having an independent currency which was devalued 50%. What did this mean? This meant that the buying power of the Icelandic nation as a whole was diminished for everybody, everybody. But we kept un um, uh, unemployment high. Even if we are uh, cutting down very drastically, as I said before, 20, 25% in real terms, the state and all municipalities, we are still, or we are now, below or just under 4% unemployment. So if we had to choose between cutting down and diminishing the buying power of uh, the entire nation by the devaluation of the currency, if we had to choose between this on the one hand and unemployment on the other, we would go for the first. And this, this is to, here we can thank standing outside the vision you have drawn up on the horizon. I'd like to make a, a, a few remarks on this, on this specific point. Um, everybody versus bias. I will only speak with my Icelandic friend, Mr. Lidak. Two remarks. One, Second World War, always an ally of NATO. We were the founding father, one of the founding fathers of Europe. I saw no problem with my colleague like minded countries. If it was so different, the Norwegians, like minded, were not member of the European Union. We were with them together in NATO. Sweden came into the European Union but never entered NATO. So this is the first thing I want to say. So you cannot say it should be done this way or that way. Mm. Also there, diversity is maybe the better solution. Second remark as a European and one of the founding fathers is that a key problem is that one has lost the sense of what we call subsidiarity. What is subsidiarity? If there is not a very convincing reason to have rules, <coughs> you better leave it to the bottom. The more subsidiarity, the better. Otherwise, Europe will become a bureaucracy, and there is a certain risk that this notion of subsidiarity is, has been lost a little bit in Europe. So these are my uh, two remarks uh, to be made. And to give a small example of the first, I was uh, the chair of Maastricht in the years at the end of the 90s that Greece has to go for yes or no with the single currency, a journalist came to me, I was those days a professor on globalization. What's your opinion about Greece? 
and I sat not being anti-Greek, they should not come into the euro because they don't meet the criteria which critique we, we defined the so-called convergence criteria as a yardstick for a country to come in, yes or no. This was not, it was not anti-Greek or anti-whatever country. It was a system to protect country against themselves. And they could not converge in those European economies and systems, so they better don't come in. Because then you lose the capacity of what you were saying, that when there is a crisis, you can solve it by devaluation. So when I look back now, I'm not blaming anybody, but I think people those days, European politicians thought, because of democracy, you have to be nice against the Greek. And I was one of those countries who was nice to accept them in the European Union. But if I had been still in power when it came to the Eurozone, I would have said, no, you're still not meeting the uh, conversion criteria. Have a look later, maybe. But don't do it. You run the risk. And when they had run that risk, it's difficult to come out the Icelandic way because that's an alternative, the Icelandic way, okay. the Croatian way. So this is a, to give you um, just a bit of a feeling that you should not simplify this as making choices. Yes or no European Union, yes or no NATO in the past, yeah? Yes or no, no, you have to look to the situation of your own country and make the best choices you can make. And for all of the European unions, I would say, go as much as possible for subsidiarity, then you have more power and creative initiative from the bottom and less bureaucracy from Brussels. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ruit. It has to be said quite straight, uh, everybody knew that uh, the Greeks have wrong statistics. I think it was pretty well known by everybody. It was a political decision and we have to suffer under the consequences in general. That has to be said, uh, defending here the Greeks. I think they made the wrong statistics, but the other knew it. <laughs> but it's sometimes happening. I think uh, Austrian banks suffered by wrong statistics of <laughs> IMF, uh, and then the IMF came and apologized for it. Uh. So far, <laughs> sometimes happening. So we are at an end. I have to look to the timetable. Uh, uh, Closing remarks, please. Mr. Thank you very much. I was going to come here and uh, invite the audience to thank you for your contributions. And uh, before dispersing, we are going to take a family picture. Then we are going to bring the Rostrum here and give the floor to uh, okay. Mr. Bissett.